I could have watched two and a half hours of Eddie Redmayne playing with these CGI magical creatures and it would have been better than the two half-assed plots they tried to throw together. Hello everybody! Welcome back to my channel and today, as you can see from the title, I'm going to be reviewing Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I know that it's a little late, I know the movie came out on the 18th and it's already the 30th, which means, by the way, just in case you were wondering, Christmas is in 26 days, so get ready. This is a little different than the rest of the content that I've been putting on this channel, but in case you don't know, I'm a really big Harry Potter fan. If you didn't know that about me, then you haven't been paying attention. I am... I love Harry Potter. I love Harry Potter. I... I love Harry Potter. I just need him to know. So, I love Harry Potter. Um, I would do literally anything to leave this place behind and enter the Harry Potter universe. But alas, I'm stuck here. And so what better way to spend my time than reviewing new Harry Potter material as it comes out. In my opinion, it's time to lay Harry to rest once and for all, at least for like five years. Like, let me need it again, right now. With all of this new material that's just been coming out one after another, it's starting to get kind of tiring. Fantastic Beasts is a perfect example of what I'm talking about right now. I made a list of four things that I loved about the movie, and then I made a list of what I hated. Fifteen things. Not even things that I hated, but fifteen things about Fantastic Beasts that didn't make sense to me, that were less than great, and that just really pissed me off. I am gonna start with what I liked. So, Number one on my list, Eddie Redmayne. Oh my god, he was phenomenal. He was easily the best part of the movie. Newt Scamander was by far the one redeemable quality about this film. Eddie Redmayne was the perfect casting choice. He is so likable. In every single one of his roles, he is just so likable. Even in Jupiter Ascending, when he played that guy and he wore the eyeliner and he was really dumb, that was Perfect. You know, you still love Eddie Redmayne. But this movie did a really good job about delving into Newt and giving us a main character that is instantly lovable. So yeah, Eddie Redmayne was fantastic. The animals and the effects and the CGI in this movie were also great. This movie did a great job of showing you all about these really, really cool animals that you would never really hear about unless you took care of magical creatures with Hagrid. The Niffler was adorable. It, it was, he was so cute. Um, the little sloth guy, what was his name, that turned invisible? He was so cute! The entire scene where Newt Scamander brought Kowalski down into his suitcase and he has this really, really awesome and clever arrangement of these different environments and habitats for these animals, that was ingenious and a really great use of CGI, a great use of magic. You know, it's just like the tents in Goblet of Fire or Hermione's purse in Deathly Hollows. Speaking of Kowalski, he was awesome. He was hilarious. He was, I mean, obviously and intended to be the comedic relief. And he did a good job of that, you know, like, he's not Ron. Sorry, but he's not Ron. Um, but he was still really funny, and his dream of wanting to be a baker, you know, fighting in World War I, that was cool stuff. And it was cool to see him incorporated as a muggle into the story, because even though Harry was raised by muggles, it's cool to see what an actual muggle thinks of the wizarding universe when he is introduced to it for the very first time. So he was really cool. I liked Kowalski. I'm glad that he had a somewhat happy ending. And that's literally it. That's what I liked about the film. Everything else... Ooh, oh god, okay, we're gonna get started because I'm gonna- I'm gonna end up rambling so bad. No, Madge? Are you serious? Like, what? What? No, Madge? It's not catchy. It's ugly. I know that Americans are dumb, but 
no match, we can do better than that. We can literally do better than that. The fact that uh, Graves thought that Credence was a squib, what, so squib is a universal term but muggle isn't? That's ridiculous. Squib is a universal term but muggle isn't? That's dumb. That's dumb. It's so weird. No offense, JK, but no Madge? Really? Really? I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm so heated about the use of no Madge, but no Madge. Really? Okay. Sorry. The second thing that I hated kind of encompasses a lot of other things. Um, there were two plots shoved into one movie. There was the plot that we were expecting, the Newt Scamander loses a bunch of his animals in New York and he has to, you know, get a group of people together to find them before they wreak havoc and, you know, unveil the magical world to all the muggles in New York. That's what we were expecting. That's what we wanted. We wanted something magical. We wanted to just be thrown into the Harry Potter universe again. We didn't necessarily want a super dark five movie franchise about an Obscurus. I'll get to the Obscurus later. Basically, there were two plots. The Obscurus slash Grindelwald plot and the Fantastic Beasts plot. We wanted the Fantastic Beasts plot, we got the Grindelwald plot, and both of them were super half-assed. I will admit that when I watched the second trailer release for Fantastic Beasts and they name-dropped Grindelwald, I flipped the fuck out. That's so cool. That is so cool. The fact that they are willing to explore Grindelwald, another dark wizard. But bros. Really? I mean, really? Colin Farrell's character, Graves. One, he was a creepy, pervy motherfucker. And two, I love you, JK, but you've already used this plot device. But the whole him turning out to be Grindelwald thing? You've already used that plot device in Goblet of Fire. I get that Grindelwald is like a really powerful wizard and stuff, but where the fuck was his polyjuice potion? Just saying, you know, just saying. Some continuity would be nice. It was just, it's repetitive. Like I said, you've done it before. We've seen that before. It would have been, to me, so much cooler if Graves had just been a fanatic, because then that shows just how powerful Grindelwald is and how powerful his influence is. But because they had it actually be Grindelwald in the end, you're like, uh, what? Speaking of Graves, I wasn't really going to talk about this. I could go in a completely another tangent about homophobia uh, and queer baiting in the Harry Potter universe, but the whole Graves and Credence weird, weird relationship was pretty gay. Not saying that in a, oh my god, I want it to be gay. I'm saying that in, back in the 20s, if you were a young man who thought you might like boys, older gay men would take advantage of you in dark alleyways, just the way that Graves did to Credence. And the whole like weird intimate touching and the whole like I trust you like take this token and all of that kind of stuff that was pretty great that was pretty creepy that's not like a complaint about the movie um it's kind of period typical so I can handle that it will be a complaint about the movie if they don't choose to explore some gayness in Grindelwald <gasps> oh I just came to that realization well, no wonder it was so intimate and creepy and pervy and gay, because Grindelwald legit is a gay man. Then it makes sense for Grindelwald, an old gay man, to be predatory to this young gay man. Again, Credence died, right, in the end, which was weird. How did they even kill him? Did they, like, Expelliarmus him to death? Um, I'm only on number four. <laughs> the fourth thing that I hated about this movie, um, Lita Lestrange. Who the fuck? Why, why all the name dropping? Like, I don't know if that was just like a weird Star Wars-esque kind of nod to the fans and the fandom. I understand that probably a lot of, of fans watching this movie freaked out when they heard Lita Lestrange because that's like, oh, it's a tie to the other, do the other series. That's so cool. It is kind of cool, but totally unnecessary. 
There was no reason to give Newt a love interest. Can you not have a movie without a fucking romance? Just asking. There was no reason to give Newt this weird, estranged, <laughs> get it, estranged, lestranged, romance. I know why they did it. They did it because they wanted Newt to have this, you know, like, anguish, this, like, love anguish inside of him so that then Tina could come along and he'd be happy again or whatever. But that was also super rushed. That's another point entirely, but let's just skip there. The two romances in this movie came out of freaking nowhere. I mean, the Queenie and Kowalski romance was a little more fleshed out, but still kind of unnecessary. Whatever, it's fine, it doesn't do any harm, but the Tina and Newt romance, completely unnecessary so rushed, so rushed, what, he comes to America and he bones the first girl he meets? No thanks! That's not, that's not cool! I, I hated that! Speaking of Tina, her character was completely flat. I really liked the actress that played Tina, but the character herself, not fun. She was boring. She was super boring. Like, so boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was mad. And then there's Queenie, who... She was gorgeous. Her smile was so beautiful. Like, they did a good job casting a very, like, hypnotic woman. The acting was so bad. The acting was so bad. She was so cheesy. And I don't know if that was supposed to be like a period typical Marilyn Monroe-esque kind of acting that she was like trying to portray, but it didn't work. She was just cheesy. And then there was the whole New Salem storyline, the new version of the, the Salem witch trials or whatever. So I get it. I get the logical jump of if you're gonna write a series, about witches in America. Salem witch trials are what you have you have to include them. Because they were kind of a big deal at the time and a lot of innocent people died and it would be really cool like theoretically to write about that. But this is 1926. There is no like residual Salem witch that happened in like the fucking 1600s, right? There's no, like, residual anti-black magic sentiment. Unless you morph it into, like, this weird Christian religious kind of thing, which is kind of what they tried to do with, you know, Credence and whatever the other people's names were. But if the New Salem thing is to be believable, it needed to happen at least a hundred years earlier, if not more. Super unrealistic. You can walk around saying, like, oh, black magic, blah, 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 in the 20s, and that would make total sense. But the 20s were such a corrupt time. And it's New York City. This is 1926 in New York City. It's the height of prohibition. It's, you know, the biggest crime rise America has ever seen. And there were, there, it was literally just like clean streets. Everybody was just chill. This is the city that never sleeps, people. And the streets were empty all the time. That makes no sense. It was just a little tiny nitpicky thing that was just dumb. The New Salem thing was, again, another half-assed plotline that was so underdeveloped that it just didn't fit. It would have been cool had they actually, you know, devoted time to making it a big storyline and actually, you know, like, writing more scenes with Credence and those kids, the weird hopscotch song that that little girl was singing about killing and witches and like burning them at the stake? What the f Who were the orphans? Did this woman, did she, was it an orphanage? What, where she, was she brainwashing these kids? Where, where did they come from? There are all of these questions. I don't know if they're going to answer them. Probably not because the woman that ran it was killed. Doesn't make any sense. If you're going to explore something that is that dark and could, like has the potential to be so cool, you have to put effort into it. You have to actually devote your time to it. Speaking of half-assed storylines, who the f was Shaw? Like what? Like who the hell was he? The whole like newspaper, okay, okay. I'm like so mad about this. This one actually might be the one that pisses me off the most because, 
Oh my god. Again, in theory, like I can see how on paper this would be a great idea where you have this really, like New York, I get it, at the time was run by newspapers. That makes total sense for this, you know, like really powerful rich guy to own this newspaper and his son is like going to be uh, an elected official and they have all this power and all of this influence and they have the ability to expose and tear down the wizard community in America. Totally get it. That's cool. They had, what, two scenes? They had like two f***ing scenes in this the two and a half hour movie. There were two scenes. Like, why did the brothers have this stupid feud or whatever? Shaw, who was supposed to be, you know, like this, you know, bright light in New York, like the elected official that's gonna like change the world or whatever, why was his only scene him shitting on Credence? Like, give me more because I can't piece anything together with what I have right now. The Shaw storyline was dumb. Okay, this isn't really a complaint because if there really are going to be four more movies and Newt Scamander hopefully plays a large role in all of them, oh my god I hope so because Eddie Redmayne was just awesome, if he does, we might get to explore the fact they, like, mentioned Newt's brother a couple of times and, like, being in the war, like, I guess he was, like, a hotshot war hero or something. That's cool. Um, I would love to see that explored a little bit more. Speaking of, whenever he, Newt's brother, was mentioned, they were in, like, this international meeting of, like, wizard leaders? What, there's, like, a wizard UN or something? Totally makes sense. The only problem is that that raises a very interesting question of where the f was that when Voldemort rose to power? It's cool that she's expanding on like wizard relations, like international wizard relations, but as far as we're aware in the original series, the only time the Minister of Magic ever, you know, spoke to another elected official was in the Half-Blood Prince when we find out that the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Magic, and the Muggle Prime Minister of England are, you know, like, in cahoots. Like, they, like, know each other. So, I'm just curious as to where the flying frick the, like, International Federation of Wizards were when Voldemort rose to power. Speaking of Voldemort and the Obscurus thing, okay, the Obscurus storyline is interesting. It's very cool. Very interesting piece of magic. Tidbit. Whatever. It explains exactly what it actually doesn't. <gasps> if I'm getting this right, an Obscurus is born with this uncontrollable energy, right? It's like they're a, like a young witch or a wizard who has so much, you know, magic inside of them that they can't control it, right? People are now saying that explains what Ariana Dumbledore was. But Ariana was uncontrollable, you know, she her magic was uncontrollable because she was attacked by some muggle kids when, when she was a kid. So that doesn't really explain what Ariana is. I, I don't know if you can get an Obscurus, if you can like become an Obscurus through a traumatic event, maybe, but whatever. I can overlook that and say that the Obscurus storyline makes sense, that's exactly what Ariana Dumbledore was, cool, fine, and again. I get that J.K. Rowling is trying to like explore new things and like introduce new magic, but an Obscurus, especially here, is such a powerful object and seems like such a powerful piece of dark magic. Don't you think Voldemort would have jumped at the chance to get a hold of one? The events of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them are so huge and so like catastrophic or whatever that you know they've got to be in some textbook somewhere or like a dark magic thing, the history of Gellert Grindelwald or something. So you know that Voldemort probably researched the Obscurus. Why didn't he find one? Um, the fact that they can just obliviate an entire fucking city with some magic rain. That would have been helpful, you know, sometime in the original series. Just so convenient. Such, you know, lazy writing, in my opinion. No offense, JK. Love you to death. Lazy writing to make that such an easy fix. Because again, could have been really cool. 
to maybe explore the Shaw storyline a little bit more, the next couple of movies can deal with the aftermath of not being able to obliviate the entire city. Like, it was just lazy. So one of the last things that I have, Johnny Depp, how in the f you can cast an abuser in a universe where abuse is one of the like main themes. Like, Harry was abused for all of his life when he was with the Dursleys, and you're just gonna cast an abuser in the Harry Potter universe because, because, why? Because Johnny Depp has, like, good cred or whatever in the film industry? I just can't believe, and I don't know if I can forgive that they cast Johnny Depp as this role. Johnny Depp has lost his relevance. You can fight me on that also if you want. And I pray, oh, how I pray that they will explore the gay. I'm not gonna sit here and, and take, oh, it was like implied that he's gay. I'm not gonna take that shit this time. That's another video. It's an entirely different conversation, the queer baiting in the Harry Potter universe. But if this movie really is going to explore the Grindelwald storyline and Dumbledore defeating Grindelwald. That's a really like huge personal thing for Dumbledore. They were best friends. They were best friends and Dumbledore was really in love with him. If they don't explore that facet of their relationship in this next, these next four movies, they will be doing the series and Dumbledore's character in Injustice. And I'll just be f mad. My battery is getting ready to die. I've ranted about Harry Potter for much too long. I probably have a lot of footage that's unusable. I'm gonna have to like bleep myself. Thank you for listening to me rant about Harry Potter. I would love to do this just weekly. If you wanna follow me on Twitter, I only ever talk about Harry Potter, so we can do that. And I talk about the good things too. If you would like me to do a video talking about the things that I love about Harry Potter, that would be awesome. I could literally probably do like a 20 minute video about how I am destined to be get married to Harry James Potter. Give this video a thumbs up if you want me to do more Harry Potter reviews or if you want me to do more movie reviews. Um, Rogue One comes out next month and I, you can bet your ass I'll be doing a Rogue One review. Thank you so much for watching. I promise that I'm not this angry all the time, but Harry Potter ignites something in me that, you know, I just gotta yell about it. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. And JK Rowling, you're not gonna watch this, but if you do, I love you. You stand for some great things, and you wrote the greatest book series of all time. And I love you for that, and I thank you for that. But come on, man. Do better. <laughs> sorry. Anyways, please like this video and subscribe. It would mean so much to me. And I will see you guys next week with a less intense video, probably about Christmas, because guess what? Tomorrow's Christmas. I'll see you next week. Bye.